Uh, you can go ahead, Little Objects. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share my story as a biological female um, who has been on the left and in woke circles and supportive of the trans community for my entire life. Um, I'm in my late 20s and in my generation, it, you kind of grew up accepting um, LGBT in general and um, it's one of those things that we didn't have to learn to accept. It, it was just kind of without question that we would accept it. Um, and so that's how I grew up and I myself am bisexual and I feel like that also went into my uh, understanding and acceptance of other people in the community. Um, so I've actually dated a few trans people and that's what makes my current position all the more confusing because I think in the past couple of months I've been, I guess, what they would call red-pilled. Um, I started noticing traits um, in my former transgender partner that were common in autogynophiles. Um, and I realized that they weren't actually transgender and that they were just a fetishist. Um, their identity was used to victimize other people sexually. And I think that's the case for a lot of people claiming to be trans, especially trans women. Um, I'm not sure exactly why it's more common in in trans women than trans men, but I will say that it seems like a uniquely male trait to be pushy, to be uniquely perverted and fetishes. Um, and that's what I experienced in my relationship with my male partner who called himself bi gender, um, wanting to be called she while we were having sex, wanting to be the feminine one, wanting to um, me to call their penis a girl dick and throwing tantrums when I wouldn't do that. Um, so I experienced emotional abuse at the hands of this person, all while feeling like a terrible person for questioning their gender identity. Because I knew that, you know, being bisexual, I knew that dating a woman, a real woman, wouldn't behave that way, in my opinion. Um, and so now I'm at a crossroads when it comes to my support of the transgender community because I I guess I would be a true scum. I think you have to have gender dysphoria to be trans. And if you don't, that's something else entirely. Um, I think non being non-binary isn't real. Um, it's made up. I think there's male, female, and transsexual, and that's pretty much it. And I'd love to hear any arguments for why that's not true. Why is there something else besides male, female, and transsexual? Because when I hear non-binary, I hear I don't feel like a man or a woman. Um, I don't feel like a woman either. I don't know what that would feel like, but I am, undeniably. So that's kind of all I had to say. So thank you guys for listening. And um, I appreciate you hosting a space where people can can talk openly about this. I haven't had much success talking to friends about this on the left. They're, they get very angry and they will um, just delete you from their life completely if you even question them. So, again, thank you for having this open space. And I will mute myself now. Thank you so much for sharing. Aaron, you can go ahead. Awesome. That was, uh, appreciate that, Anne. That was, that was an excellent contribution. Um, I'm kind of responding to uh, the previous speaker. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, um, where you were uh, unfortunately talking about that uh, that ex-partner of yours who was autogynophilic and kind of put you through some pretty bad uh, situations uh, on the basis of that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, what I wanted to add to that, though, is you said there, there's you know people with gender dysphoria or fetishists, and there's uh, males and females or transsexuals, um, and I just wanted to kind of bring it back to the fact that there's it's we're still just male or female. 
Um, a transsexual person is just somebody who's attempting in some level to transition from one sex to the other. But we are still the, the, the sex that we are. Uh, like I'm, I am female. I will always be female. Um, being a transsexual just means that, you know, I, I superficially look male. Um, uh, so I just wanted to put that in there. And then also, um, and not to diminish the, 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 the experience you had with that ex-partner, but the reality is, is autogynophilia is a primary driver in sex dysphoria for male to female transitioners. So again, it's not that kind of, uh, that simple thing is like a transsexual or an autogynophile. You know, you have autogynophilia or you're dysphoric. Autogynophilia is a type of dysphoria that is the primary cause of male to females transitioning in the first place. Um, so I just wanted to you know, kind of throw that in there in case it was was helpful at all. Um, Arya, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Um, I'll, I'll try to make it short. I know other people haven't spoken yet. Um, I wanted to talk about autogynophilia as a male to female transsexual. Um, I myself um, identified about a decade before I started my transition as a gay male. And so I don't, unless I'm unaware, I don't seem to um, embody any of the traits or most of the traits that, that people will talk about when discussing autogynophilia. Um, but I have had a lot of experience that um, Little Objects was talking about, um, which I absolutely hate that that was your experience. Um, not just because I have shared that experience, but because it is living proof that a lot of the current uh, trans right movement is very harmful. Um, and I know people will say it's not directly harmful against women, but it's all about coercion and i do see that the coercion begins in the person's own psyche they're they're coercing themselves in fantasies um they coerce themselves in humiliation because of those fantasies there is a fantasy shame cycle um and not to get too graphic i know that the the, the male orgasm definitely plays a part in that um, when you're able to enjoy yourself to that fantasy that will continue to heighten that fantasy. We, we, we see that happen in all sorts of different um, um, paraphilia. And I, when I first came out, I was definitely preyed upon by, by various people who call themselves trans women. And I would never say that there are no authentic male to female transsexuals who are autogynophilic, but I know that a lot of them are not in good faith and there are a lot of ill intent and I was never personally harmed in a physical way but I, I my instinct my fight-or-flight instinct came up multiple times within the first year of my transition that I was leery and still am leery of most other people who call themselves trans women um, I find that the people that I can relate to call themselves either transsexual or they say that they have transitioned as opposed to calling themselves trans and calling themselves trans is to sort of to cite the difference that we are trans women as opposed to biological women. I, I do think that that is a growing minority because I, I do see that with, we did ourselves a grave disservice by changing gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria because even though I understand why we did so by saying, oh, we're not a, we're not a fetish, we're not um, insane, we are not mentally ill, we still see mental illness rife and it's only grown. And I think changing it over to gender dysphoria, dysphoria is much more nebulous. It's much more open-ended and broad. And so I think that it has allowed a lot more people who are not genuinely trans to enter the arena i've been approached by people who they have cross-dresser or sissy in their profile name they will come to me and say how gorgeous i am and beautiful and I'll, I'll tell them up front i am not attracted to women and so many times i've had them say well i don't have to be one if that's not what you want and it's it's they're they're showing themselves they're exposing themselves right off the bat saying oh you don't want me this way you can have me that way and that, I don't know how prevalent it is, but it does worry me that when when you have a lot of trans people who say, oh, these these 
these issues of predators being in women's spaces that's that's not a thing that happens these are these are fears this is you're you're looking at you know this is like a a, a scare porn basically you you're getting off to the idea that trans women are are pred predators meanwhile they are allowing predators to coexist and call themselves trans women by saying that that's not real it's signaling the go-ahead to people to go oh well, then if I say I'm a woman, they will believe me because they say that this thing that I'm doing isn't real. Uh, thanks for sharing, Aria. Um, little little objects, did, did you want to jump in? I know, I think a lot of people have been talking about autogophenia because of uh, your story. Yeah, I wanted to reply to Aaron first because he initially replied and I was kind of surprised to hear what I think you were saying about um, autogynephilia being like a reason for some people to transition. And at first that kind of took me by surprise, but I guess that does make sense um, after hearing Arya speak as well. Um, I just, to me, that term is like almost inherently negative because it's, it feels like it's objectifying women and that's what like a, what separates for me a real trans woman and a not real trans woman is someone that makes a fetish of it. I think it, if, if your transition includes, um, sexual aspects, I understand, but that being the driving force, um, makes me pretty confident that that person is not a real trans woman, um, or trans person because, uh, it seems, again, like something a perverted male would do just to get by without scrutiny. Um, no real person is going to be driven by their sexual perversions enough to transition um, unless, unless they're a pervert. Does that make sense? Is it okay if I jump the key? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say, go for it. Okay, okay. Um, so I think I think it's important to I, I, so okay we we got to differentiate autogynephilia the the kind of internal uh, it, it, it's like um it's, it's like heterosexuality boomeranging right so so it is it is a very male typical um, experience it is heterosexuality that just kind of misfires back at oneself so you are you are uh, sexually and romantically attracted to yourself as a woman. Um, so uh, it gets a lot of bad rap as being like a fetish and a perversion. Um, that's, I think that has more to do with oftentimes the very, very coercive and abusive um, uh, kind of sexual situations that autogynophiles can put their female partners in to aid in, um, in, in you know, validating their, you know, their female identity. Um, and you obviously were on the receiving end of that. So I can obviously certainly uh, sympathize with, with you seeing it as a perversion and not real, uh, not real trans woman. But the reality is throughout history, the majority of male to female transitioners have had this motivation for transitioning. And it's, I think it's really important to not think in terms of real trans people. Because what we really are is really male or really female, and our motivations are going to be thus aligned. Um, so, so a female, a male to female transitioner, whose motivators are going to be primarily sexually motivated in a lot of ways that, that kind of males are more sexually motivated um, in general. And this is not to disparage like uh, at all any any trans women, but but male sexuality, trans women are male, and male sexuality is much more object oriented. And uh, and what autogynephilia is, is is a target location error where the the object of one's heterosexuality just reverts back at oneself. Uh, there's a really good in, uh, uh, YouTube video of this this 19 year old English boy who's got autogynephilia and he shares it with a very very um, just just he, he explains it beautifully. Um, I, I recommend watching that. I will I will share it um, uh, on my feed. Uh, right after this and then also the latest episode of gender a wider lens a podcast uh with debbie hayton who is a also an english uh female a male to female transitioner who explains her experience with uh with autogynephilia um 
but uh, but yes, it's very it's a very very common experience. Um, it is a primary driver in uh, male to female transitioning, um, and yes, it can result in very toxic, abusive uh, behaviors. But if people are aware that that is where they're 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 kind of um, they, why they're fixated on manifesting a female self, and they're self aware about that, and they can respect boundaries and which obviously everybody is capable of. Um, autogynophilia is entirely harmless. Um, but, but yeah, it's just when, when we live in this denial that experiencing that kind of sexual attraction means one is a real woman, which is the state we're in. It's fueling most of gender ideology right now is that feeling meaning you are a real woman. Um, and so if we, if we can acknowledge what autogynophilia is, I don't want to say destigmatize it, but, but, um, uh, separate it from a perversion and realize it is an internal experience often starts in childhood, increases with puberty, um, uh, and, and, and if we can talk about it honestly and not say that it means somebody's a real woman, um, it, it's, I think it's Im- important. Um, but yeah, I will, I will send, I don't know if you want to send them to you directly or I can, I'll put them on my, um, uh, my, my feed is those mess, uh, those I was say, uh, videos I'm talking about. You can put it on your feed if you want and then I'll, uh, I'll add. Oh, dope, dude. I'll add okay. it to the top yeah, here. That. I put a gender wider lens at the top. Everybody, uh, highly recommend that podcast, uh, follow them. They're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, I believe. Uh, they made a really great episode on AGP with David Debbie Hayton, and then uh, Aaron. If you if you find that autobiophilia video, I think I know which one you're talking about, but I'll I'll add it to I'll pin it at the top here as well. Okay. So, wait, I'll send that over right now. Um, little objects. Did you want to say any anything else? I know I I know a lot of people have their hands up, uh, but did you want to respond to Aaron at all uh, before I move on to the next person? Yeah, uh, I'll just say thank you for explaining that because that really helped me understand. But yeah, you can just move on to the next person. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Tage? Yeah, thanks. I know I've spoken as well, so uh, this will maybe be my last turn. But I also just want to thank Aaron for being here because it was something I'm thinking about as well and something I think about in politics. Uh, and I can imagine that autogynophilia is going to become a, a very big part of our dialogue very soon. And it's going to be derogatory, and I'm sure it's going to be overprescribed, and it's going to be admitted in bad faith to to discredit people, even though it's a real thing, and and it shouldn't be uh, stigmatized, sort of in a sense. And I see the same thing in in uh, different uh, political conversations where they assume that a fetish uh, or you know uh, being interested in dating a black woman is is a fetishization when it's just, you, you know, it's related to your sexuality and the, the moral judgment on it is, is maybe not so uh, sharp. And, and, uh, and, and I think you see this as well in uh, the term uh, uh, social contagion. Like it's, it's a very negative term. It's, you know, associated with a disease or a virus spreading. And um, it's just going to get in the way. And um, I hope we can find new terms that help us actually figure out and come to a consensus on on reality and and less of a fight thanks stage uh n n d l all right <laughs> ready you can go ahead yeah it took me it took me a while to really understand how common a g p was when i when i first came out you know, I was told a whole lot of things that weren't true, for me at least. And what I realized is the dominant discourse Hello? is the autogynophilic discourse. Can you hear me? Who's yeah. That? Yeah, I we hear you. To speak, you but I guess my, my thing wasn't working very well. Can you hear me now? We can yeah. hear you now. Go okay, ahead. Okay, can I just, I just wanted to say, um, you know, about that tweet up there, you know, people can add. We can't hear you. All right, go go ahead. <laughs> uh, Ratty, just go ahead. Yeah, I think what people don't understand is, is most of what has always been the dominant transsexual discourse has been the autogynophilic one. And it, it took me reading some uh, a a book by Dr. Ann Lawrence called Men Trapped in Men's Bodies. 
to really fully appreciate that almost everything the public knows about transsexualism is through the autogynophilic lens. And that's because the most common trans people of history that you know are autogynophilic. Um, I am old enough that I remember when Renee Richards was a thing and I was at, a, at an age where I was, um, I went through high school with people wondering when I was going to have a sex change. That's how, that's how feminine I was as a, as a, as a teenager at least. And I, I took one look at Renee Richards and was like, oh my God, I can never look like that. But Renee Richards is what people of my generation think of as a, quote, trans woman. And Renee Richards is autogynophilic. Caitlyn Jenner is autogynophilic. Um, Christine, not Christine Jorgensen, um, Jan Morris. You can go down the list of so many of the best known transsexual women, and they are, by and large, autogynophilic. Um, and so the notion that that it's rare or it's new or it's, oh, they're all freaky weirdo perverts. Um, you know, Jan Morris was a highly respected writer. She wrote travel magazines or books or whatever it was. She climbed Mount Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary when she was still a guy. These are the people we know. The, the, the people who was pressuring, who was it? Um, Oh God, I forgot who you were again. The one who was was talking about their partner insisted that they call their penis a girl dick or something. Um, that's bizarre behavior, and it's that does not seem to be the the norm. But most of what people know, um, unless you know, I don't want to say showgirls, but transsexual showgirls and the like then what you see in public is autogynophilic transsexuals. That's it. Thanks, Reddy. Avery, would you like to go now? Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, I really appreciated what Aaron said about autogynophilia just because the um, – the scientific side, I feel, is very important. People can get quite um, ideological and quite passionate, and I think it's important to look at the science and also just look at what makes logical, factual sense. Um, I think there's like a discussion of who is really trans, and the reality is, because I come, I come from the more rad femme side of things in some ways, in other ways not so, um, but, you know, human beings cannot change sex. It's not possible. And you can't, you can't really change your gender either. So to say who's truly trans, well, you know, some trans people, some trans people are, seem to be just heterosexuals who don't like their birth sex. Some of them seem to be homosexuals who, uh, there is a sexual orient, I'm not saying, not to say that it's sexually motivated, but some transsexual people seem to be homosexuals who have a sexual orientation based motivation, which is distinct from, uh, autogynophiles who have a sexual fetishist motivation. Um, but generally the idea I will, I do want to challenge the idea that autogynophilia is inherently harmless. Um, I don't, I think maybe if we lived in a bubble world with no other factors, maybe autogynophilia would be harmless. Um, but I think autogynophilia, I personally regard it, um, as, and I have had a few, I grew up quite nerdy. And so I have some male friends who have come out as autogynophilic um, over the years of two of whom have desisted and one who's gone forward. Um, and I would say that autogynophilia in most, because I think women don't understand fetishes because most, the vast majority of all fetishes occur in males. So when women and in feminism, when we as a group of predominantly women assess fetishes, um, sometimes there may be the idea that a fetish is harmless or just, I, like there's kind of a female centric understanding of fetishes in feminism. And I feel like something I had to realize as a woman is that I'm not ever going to really understand fetishism because it's not something that occurs that often in the female population. And so what the science says about fetishes is that when you have one, it's almost all, all every fetish occurs 
primarily, very primarily in males, except masochism, which occurs primarily in females. Um, and when you have one fetish, you're more likely to have another one. So people who are, who are autogynephilic, that maybe they're not going to hurt you with autogynephilia. Maybe they're not going to be one of those people who has an additional fetish. Um, and I'm not, and I don't know what proportion of autogynephiles have fetishes, other fetishes, but sometimes an autogynephile is also a voyeur. Sometimes an autogynephile is also a sadist. Um, and so it's important to understand, although I do feel, I do feel that autogynephilia in our current world is harmful. I don't think most of the harm comes intrinsically from the fetish. I think that the, my male friends I know who have turned, have, uh, declared themselves trans feminine and desisted to me, my experience is that most of the harm they've perpetrated against me as their friend has come from the delusional beliefs of gender ideology. And they, it has, I feel sorry for them because they've been led to believe that it's acceptable to like follow me into the bathroom. And I don't think they'd be doing that otherwise. Um, especially because many of the men who get involved in this stuff are autistic. So it's like, it's just sad. Like it's like a bunch of men who are autistic and then we're like giving them the wrong social cues. And I'm like, they don't even have a chance. Like we've got to do a little bit better, be a little more honest um, so that people are not, people are have the ability to be self-aware about their fetish and about the fact that no, it's not inherently harmful to have a sexual fetish, but don't be whipping it out in public. Cause then that's when it starts to get, we're, and we're encouraging people to just have really bad social judgment. Thanks, Avery. Uh, Aria? Yeah, um, so actually going off that, um, I think I came off a little harsh against um, people who are not kind of like, and I want to apologize for that. Um, because what Avery is saying, I actually, it, it, it does, it resonates more with me that in and of itself, on its own, without context, it is not harmful. Um, I think, and I think this might be where um, what I was saying before that I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by going from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, because right now there is a lot of push to remove all um, necess necessity for therapeutic intervention, um, be it before transition or during. And I understand that there are people right now in the psychological professions who are predatorial or not necessarily predatorial, but who are going to recommend everything but transition. And so there are those people who feel like they're running up against a wall. But I do think that there is a lot of good that can be done for those, whether it's regardless of, of the, the source or the, if you want to call it subtype of, of a transgender person, there is a lot of good. Um, I mean, I elected to go to therapy on my own um, because I knew I needed it anyway. And I, I think that as a transgender person, regardless of your past, there, there should be that component, not because you need to fix something or because somebody needs to do something for you, but this is such a, an enormous leap. This is such an enormous um, journey. And I think that it is necessary to be able to even just to talk to someone to bounce something out so that you're not con consistently either in your head with what you believe about yourself or online with what the, the a lot of the current rhetoric is and so i i think that taking the therapeutic portion away from it i think there is a lot of fear about that right now because of the tendency if there is no therapy even if a person starts off with every good intention and there's no harm, if you're not able to get a handle on your transition and such a, a large, not, it doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody in your life, then it could turn into something harmful without you meaning to and without you being in and of yourself a harmful person. Um, and so I, because I, I have been, you know, and I, I'm not going to, try to brag, but I, I, I am looked at by um, people who are, whether they are cross-dressing or they are transitioning, um, I am looked at similarly to how I have heard a lot of, bio a lot of biological women say that they are treated. Um, the fawning, the jealousy, 
the, oh, you're so gorgeous. Oh, I wish I could be like you. And there's always, a, there, not always, there's almost always a sexual component of you did such a wonderful job. I would, and, and, and there's this, this correlation of, I want to be with you and I want to be you. And I've received that from people, whether it's overtly in those exact words or just in the, the demeanor and the, the type of interactions that I have with people. And I don't think that in and of itself that that's harmful, but I think that for those of us who, whether we are um, transgender women who are not attracted to other transgender women, whether or, or if you are biological women who are the recipient of this, um, that it would be very helpful for a lot of people to be able to go to somebody outside of that as opposed to bringing it back in to somebody else. Like it's not our responsibility to lead and to guide and to teach femininity because that's not something you can really learn from somebody else. You have to be able to find whoever you are from within yourself and that needs to be done with genuine, authentic self-work. I just want to say uh, uh, about the idea that autogynophilia uh, is harmless. Like, I don't want to say that it's, I think it's completely harmless. I think what, or I think it's harmless in a bubble. Like, I think whether or not it's inherently harmful is like a complicated discussion. Um, but I do, because autogynophilia, even when you take away all the gender ideology and stuff, it is, as a woman, it's incredibly irritating to feel imitated. And I do think the people who compare it to blackface like do kind of have a point and it makes like just to be around people who are all guys feel like like it makes me feel uh demeaned and like they think that women are stupid and trivial um but uh i do think like from a practical standpoint we can't be like autogynophiles are evil because these people who are identifying as women women eventually they're going to have to come out as autogynophiles or else the problem's never going to go away mm -hmm. so if we completely demonize the solution to the problem it's like going to be a bad situation Thanks, uh, Avery. Aria, I don't know if you wanted to say something re in response to that um, um, before I move on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, not being one myself, um, a, a biological woman, uh, a female, um, I don't understand the perspective, but I can say I, I do understand feeling as though it's a fetish, feeling as though I, because I know the difference between being with people who are secured in themselves and they are transitioning and you know when I'm around trans women who are somewhat like-minded and I know how it feels I've been in situations um, I was in a situation where it was an entire group of people and I was one of only a couple people who were not um, not a gynophilic and I didn't feel as though they themselves were harmful as people I felt as though my being in earnest, wanting to to learn from people, because I've been told, oh, these we've been transitioning for X amount of years, and I thought I was going into this sort of mentorship, like I'm starting out, I knew how does this work, only to find out that there were a lot of sexual encounters in and amongst the group. There were fetishists who would be part of the group who were um, cisgender male um, that were accepted because they appreciated that these men were giving them sexual attraction. And these men were then put off by the fact that I was not interested in that because that's not why I was there. Um, so yeah, I, I do I do understand the the frustration and when it when it turns into this is all that they that that, that a person is about. Yeah, I agree. It's not what all the person is about. I also kind of like the idea that a like a person is harmful like all people are harmful i don't think they're i think the idea that we as humans need to be completely pure and harmless is not realistic um and so like yeah do some people have harmful fetishes or fetishes that are maybe not the most morally upstanding in the world yes um does that mean we discard like it gets to a level of like cancel culture like we don't just discard every person who has a flaw because we're all flawed um but it's just it's challenging because maybe and I think many of the women on on radical feminist Twitter like um, I'm bisexual I primarily date men but I would not consider myself super gender conforming and I think because I am not a highly feminine person when somebody starts acting although like 
I don't know, as somebody with both masculine and feminine qualities, it's like sometimes it makes me feel mocked because I'm like, okay, I don't do that. Like, I don't wear skirts. My dress doesn't go spinny. Like, I just don't do that. And then other times, if it's something that I do do, I'm like, well, you're doing it poorly. Like, a lot of these autogynophiles, they, they're they like, I'm going to, I feel so affirmed. I'm finally going to wear makeup. And I'm like, your makeup looks like shit. And people are telling you that it looks good. And, like, some of us actually try to, and, like, <laughs> some of us try to have, you know, I sit in the mirror trying to get the eyeliner pointy and you like smudge some shit on your face <laughs> and you're making fun of me like <laughs> this, this, it's, really cool. <laughs> it's just and it's a different it is it's an, ex, it's an extreme form of male heterosexuality and maybe if if autogynophiles were more self-aware about it and they did not claim to be imitating me maybe it would be less frustrating but sometimes i become cons- like i'm like is there an element of delusion because I, like my friends who are autogynophilic, like they keep saying that they feel like they're feminine. Most of them are just men who are who are kind of either submissive sexually or submissive in social situations. Oh. And I'm like, I don't think that your inability to stand up for yourself interpersonally and your desire to be dominated in the bedroom is equivalent to my like sex based oppression. And oh, yeah. I pride myself on my assertiveness. So these men who don't assert themselves and they think you think it's feminine to be weak, submissive, trivial, superficial. And I'm like, well, I can regard myself as an intellectual and assertive person. And it just like is I'm like, maybe instead of doing a gender transition, like be tougher or like learn. I don't I don't I don't understand. I guess I'm not not a gynophile. I don't get it. Most of the men that I know who are autogynophiles. They're just like dudes that are kind of shy and they, and they're, they're men who I've known them in my life. Sometimes they rely on me to help them assert themselves. And then I'm like, well, all of these times I told you to be more assertive. And then you're like, I'm going to be like Avery by becoming like very submissive. I'm like, what? Like you've met, I'm like these, I'm like, you've met me. You know, I'm not like this. So why do you think that this is like me? It's just, I, it's very confusing, but partially just because I'm not, not a gynophile, but I just don't get it. And it's weird. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Aver. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and let uh, uh, I believe Angie's Angie's next or, or Ratty. Twenty five years ago, we did not tolerate somebody just saying I'm a woman. You know, like, hey, I came out yesterday and now I'm a woman. And twenty five years ago, if you said, you know. I came out yesterday and now I'm a woman. We would have told you to shut the fuck up because it was the dumbest thing imaginable. If you had not fully transitioned all your legal paperwork, your name change, your social circle knows all of that stuff, we would we would not have accepted it. And so the the gender ideology is has totally changed. No longer does it matter if you try. All that matters now is you say so. And, and that's been a huge, huge change. 